This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. I told you we'd be back, and we're back, like MacArthur. Huh? Yeah. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. That's Mike Hamnett. We're co-chairs of this Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy uh, program, which happens um, every Wednesday at 4 p.m., a courtesy of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, of which Mike is the co-chair of that, too. Yeah, with Sharon Morawaki, who yeah. just retired. Yeah. And we're going to keep her involved. Far away. Yeah. <laughs> also running for office. Yes. <laughs> okay, and we're doing today something called the intersection of our energy and the law, courtesy the William S. Richardson School of Law. And uh, we entitled this on the tagline, uh, will William S. Richardson please speak up? <laughs> and you guys are going to speak up. We have three of you. I know there are only two of you now, but we have a third one too. Okay, so in my immediate right is Natalie Moreland, a student at the William S. Richardson School of Law. And at her left, did I say you were at my right? At my left was Natalie, and then at her left is Gavin Tom. And at Mike Hamlet's extreme left is Nathaniel Muller. Okay? In the wing. He'll come, he'll come on the table shortly. Okay, and they're all students. So, welcome to the show, you guys. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you. Thanks Thanks nice to be here. Yeah, great. Why don't you come back over and over again, you know? Mm -hmm. It's part of your legal experience, you know? I will. I'm yeah. going to invite. <laughs> okay, so we're going to find out what you guys have been studying at the intersection, the intersection between our energy and the law. Natalie, you're first. Okay, so we are three of nine, I believe, students in Richard Walsgrove's um, clean energy law and policy class. So we've been studying all about um, the clean energy landscape in Hawaii um, in particular. And, um, and it's been fun. So yeah, we're here to talk about our, um, our final project. So when you say studying, <laughs> what do you mean? Is, is there a horn book on the subject? No, there isn't. So we have... They're writing one. Yeah. <laughs> They're writing it now, right? <laughs> so we just have a syllabus, and um, Professor Walsgrove puts all of... Um, oh, he organizes it by topic, and then he'll come up with um, just the materials that we use for the class. And so he'll give us lists of statutes, he'll give us white papers to read, He'll give us court cases, um, PUC decisions. Okay, and, and your topic, if you came here today <laughs> with something in mind, something you've been reading about or thinking about or writing about, what is that? So I'm talking about exit fees, and um, this is particularly in the context of um, customers who are exiting the grid or defecting from the grid. Um, and exit fees are becoming a bigger issue because the cost of battery storage is declining um, and the cost of electricity keeps rising and, and it's becoming more economical for people to install solar plus battery storage and independent from the grid um, than it is to remain um, connected. Okay. And, yeah, so I'm considering um, whether the PUC has the authority to impose exit fees um, and whether it should or should not. Let me add a fact to this porridge and see if Mike agrees with me. Last time I knew about this, if you wanted to merely have a holding pattern in your relationship with the utility and not use any energy from the utility yeah. and not sell them any energy, just sort of zero both ways, it would cost you as much as $18 a month. That was if you stayed connected to the grid and didn't use any electricity. Right. So, but, you know, if your system broke, if your batteries, you know, failed, if your solar cracked, I don't know what happens, um, you could call on the utility to supply you just as much as you need, and the cost of that insurance, so to speak, was roughly $18. That's month. right. Okay, we're throwing that in the parts. How does this affect your thinking, Natalie? Well, I think it all comes down to whether that $18 a month is something that um, the customer thinks is, is worth something. Um, I think that if there were, for example, reconnection fees, then the $18 a month insurance policy might be not a bad idea. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, it all just comes down to the, the costs and benefits of, of doing one or the other. And, um, and my thinking is that um, exit fees aren't going to be totally necessary because of those factors, um, because of the benefits that there are for staying connected to the grid and for the benefits the utility will get from those customers. Yeah, we, okay, made Mike, a, we, made a we made a bad decision when we first started with net metering and feed-in tariffs because they didn't really think about what, who was going to bear the cost of maintaining the wires. And that's really <laughs> where they got caught. And there was this huge exodus, uh, I mean, a huge number of people that took the $18.75 a month and the utility said, hey, wait a minute, this is not covering our costs, <laughs> which is why this whole question is, is back up in the air. Yeah. And, and as you reduce the number of people out there yeah, who goes are higher. on the grid, the utility taking a big loss on this $18, you know, they can't maintain their infrastructure that way. So, problem. Okay, but the thing about the PUC, I mean, <clears throat> let, me, let me just react. Can I react? Sure. I'm reacting. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> why doesn't the PUC have authority? I mean, one day the PUC may decide that as a matter of policy, they want to impose or not impose, whatever, you know, address the question. Maybe it would come up on the basis, for example, of an application, a, a docket application by the utility that they wanted exit fees in order to, you know, discourage and de-incentivize people who want to leave the grid. Uh, they didn't want them leaving it. Okay. So the other PUC, is there any question, really, that the PUC could, they could impose a lot of, a lot of tariffs and charges and all kinds of, look at your electric bill one of these days, mm -hmm. there's all kinds of things, why couldn't the PUC or the utility or a combination of them do that without legislative, uh, you know, imprimatur? Well, so without legislative um, authority or without the specific language in a statute, um, the PUC does have the authority to set reasonable rates and to impose these tariffs, but that's assuming that you're imposing these tariffs on a customer. And when a customer is exiting, they're basically saying, we are no longer a customer, you don't have the authority to impose this fee. So mm. legally, I think, mm. I think the safest route, if exit fees were, um, were the, you know, a, a good policy decision, would be to go through it through the legislature and put um, a provision in the PUC statute authorizing That would be the safer it. way, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I think so. Yeah. Otherwise, we're going to end litigation. up in court. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Well, Gavin, you've heard, you've heard Natalie you know, talk about her thinking mm -hmm. and research and her at least preliminary conclusions. How much of what she said do you agree with? Um, well, it's interesting. My, uh, my particular paper is on uh, the city's kind of introduction to Renewable, renewable vehicles. So we're talking about clean energy vehicles, and they're, um, I believe the mayors of all the islands met back, I think, in January 2018, and um, expressed a resolution, at least the mayors of Maui and Honolulu did, um, to go cl uh, clean 100% energy um, efficient vehicles by 2035, I think 10 years before um, before the has to go. Um, but uh, it's interesting in that, um, sorry, um, it's interesting because uh, if we look at um, Natalie's idea of exit fees um, and my, uh, the city's idea of introducing all these renewable vehicles, what energy is going to be left if we don't have consumers and people maintaining that base load? So the buses, let's say, if we're introducing 500 new electric buses, um, that introduces, a, I think, a, if my math is correct, then it might not be. Um, I'm in law school for a reason. But um, <laughs> it introduces about 180 megawatts. You just, you just you know. studied derivatives of <laughs> <laughs> um, It introduces about 180 megawatts of needed power to just for this new bus system that they may, may or may not introduce. So if we're having customers leave the grid and just be independent, who essentially will pay for that? So, I mean, other than the city and county, if everyone exits, Well, Mike and yeah. me, we'll pay for it. We always do. <laughs> They'll be after us and we'll have to write a check for it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm only half joking. I mean, the taxpayers will. That's true. And the rate, rate pays, I have to pay for it. That's what happens, yeah. But, um, you know, so what is legal about your analysis? It sounds like an economic analysis. True. Um, Professor Walgrove um, gave us an interesting choice choice to write our papers on, and I took a maybe a unorthodox approach. I I wanted to learn more about 
solar energy. So I'm looking at the placement of solar cells on vehicles in comparison to solar farms. Um, maybe from a procurement perspective under HRS uh, 103D. And um, the paper centers around the efficiency of solar cells, essentially, if it's viable, if it's cost effective. And then you place that under a regulatory framework that Hawaii has, where it's the bidders are essentially lowballing sometimes. And, procurement code. Yeah, the procurement code. Um, you end up with the lowest bidder who has the lowest efficiency, which may or may not be the best way to approach our, our goals, our ultimate goals of clean energy, 100% clean So what would you throw out the procurement code? I threw out the procurement code in a nanosecond myself. <laughs> I think Mike would agree with me on that. <laughs> he would say this after he retired, yeah. No, but RCUH was exempt from the procurement oh, code. Oh, God, so. that's, oh, now I understand yeah. everything. Yeah. Okay, so maybe there's a legal point there in the mm -hmm. procurement code if you're dealing with government acquisition and all that. Um, but, you know, I, I like to throw something your way also, as I did with Natalie. Okay, <clears throat> I don't know if you remember this, Mike, but years ago, there was, um, when we started with Carl Friedman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the notion was we're going to make an index of how much oil we're bringing into the state for transportation, for, uh, you know, planes, for aircraft, for cars, all that, uh, and, and for generation of electricity. And we wanted to develop an index, which we have been developing an right. index. And one of, the, uh, one of the participants in this very open-ended meeting uh, was Henry Curtis, and he said, you guys are missing something. You have to calculate the amount of oil that is in furniture. Furniture. There's plenty of oil in furniture. You know, and at the time I said, what? What is this? What? But you know, since then, I, I begin to think about it, and uh, we, we're all down on fossil fuel. It's mm -hmm. a bad thing. But <clears throat> this morning, this morning before I came here, I was watching a video on, on YouTube. Uh, you know, because what happens is one follows the other, you know, it's almost <laughs> involuntary. And it said, you know, do you realize that, that there's oil in everything, in, in, in petrochemistry, chemi it's everything we do. And if we stopped having any oil, I mean, you, there, would be no, there would be no toothbrushes, no toothpaste. Um, you know, everything would stop. It's not just the cars, it's everything. So are you factoring that in, Gavin? I mean, fact is that oil is not necessarily bad. We need mm -hmm. oil for civilization. Um, so, you know, and, and solar, you, you heard it here on Think Tech. Solar <laughs> is not going to replace, it's not going to make a, a, a toothpaste for you mm -hmm. or, or a toothbrush. None of that. Yeah, yeah I think it's a, <clears throat> an interesting point, Jay. Um, when, like I was saying before, if we introduce a whole bunch of new battery powered, let's say, vehicles to the grid, um, that energy needs to come from somewhere. And we know while we're attempting to build tons of solar farms, maybe wind farms, maybe in the future even tidal stuff, um, that energy in the meantime is going to come from petroleum, burning oil, burning coal. And it's the easiest. I mean, we took a visit to the uh, waste energy plant. Um, <clears throat> H-Power. Huh? H-Power. And right next to it is the AES coal plant. And that produces, I believe, three times 180, 180 meg megawatts mm -hmm. in comparison. So um, when we introduce, let's say, an 180 megawatts of bus battery, a need for power, um, either we're going to have to inc greatly increase our renewable energy source or, again, we'd still be relying on fossil fuels. Are, are you going to go into energy law somehow? Um, what, well, what, what what year are you guys in? In the third year. Third year. Yeah. Oh, One so month. now it's getting <laughs> yeah. serious. Oh yeah. If you got this far, you you must have a real commitment, eh? I guess I can't stop now. <laughs> can't stop <laughs> no. now. Gavin, okay, how about you? Are, are you a third year also? Third year also. Okay, so, so it's a little too late. So you want to you want to get a job here? What do you? Who do you? How do you want to get? How do you want to work this angle? In? Well, I think um, clean energy is the future. Um, right now, unfortunately, I am not working in clean energy. Um, my background is more in courtroom experience litigation. Um, they, was, they have energy in, in litigation, too. Yeah, that's true. Plenty. Yeah. So, <laughs> I mean, I am always open to any future industries okay, and clean yeah. energies. Yeah. The, other, the other thing everybody seems to forget is we have to firm the intermittent power from solar and wind. And, you know, everybody's talking about, well, we could go 100% solar. Okay, so then when the sun stops shining, then what? 
uh, or when the wind stops blowing. And it's still, unless we get a firm source of power, we're going to be stuck with petroleum as the, as the firming power. But that's why I think, um, you know, this issue of, of exit fees or from customers exiting because they're installing solar plus battery storage is really interesting because the battery can, um, can take the uh, solar energy that's right. produced during the day and export it at the times when you know, the demand is highest. And so it can at least reduce the need to, um, to keep all of the, the oil plants. Right. Burning. No, no, no. I, I agree. But it's going to be a long time before we confirm the power with batteries yeah. entirely. Yeah, true. Aspirations true. do not always materialize. No. And the aspirations cost money, too. <laughs> Materialization costs more money. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, so uh, what did we learn here today, Mike, so far? Uh, we were about to go to our break, but I thought, you know, if you would summarize, and then we'll see if they agree with your summary. We've got law students doing interesting <laughs> stuff on energy. <laughs> it's part of their training, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but the, uh, the, uh, the exit fee idea is, is an interesting one. Um, they're going to, somehow the PUC and the, the power companies are going to have to deal with this keeping people on the grid somehow. And I think the, the notion of uh, very high reconnection fees is probably legally the best way to go because we don't need any le new legislation to do that. PUC right. can give people them authority. People will think twice, won't they? Yeah. yeah. I told you about that reporter for our civil beat who went off into the woods and separated from the grid, came back and made a speech. I wrote an article, actually, in civil beat about it, and he said, I'll never do that. <laughs> so the market, you know, the market and the experience that he had, which will be repeated, you know, which is being repeated, um, that, that, will, that, will, that will affect people's conduct. Mm -hmm. We are, I, I, but I, what I appreciate about both of you guys is that you're looking into how people conduct themselves, how they think about this, because energy is a moving target. And it, it ultimately, it's a, an expression of the community, because that's people either do it or don't do it. And, and we, we have to see where they're going without our, without our incentives or disincentives. We also have to see what kind of incentives or disincentives we need to impose on them legally, um, you know, to have them, us, all of us go the right direction. Well, and to keep the social the, policy. And to keep the energy system working. I mean, that's... Yeah, that too. I got to, before we go to the break, I just want to tell you a story. Okay, Sharon Moriwaki and I are in Lanai. And Lanai, you know, they didn't want the windmills there. And, and they ultimately stopped them. Um, <clears throat> so we were talking to a bunch of high school kids there. And I said, to, this is all on film. I said to this young woman, I said, uh, you know, if you don't have wind or, uh, or fossil fuel, um, how, and you only have, uh, I said, what, what, do you, what do you use? She said, we use, we would like to use solar for everything. I said, but solar goes off at night, right? What are you going to do when the sun sets? And she says, no problem. We'll go to sleep early. <laughs> That'll solve it. This, this only works on the Native yeah. Islands. Right. Okay, <laughs> Natalie, Gavin, thank you for coming thank down. Thank you guys thank very you. much. We're going to take so a much. short break, and, and then thank we're going to talk to Nathaniel. All right? Good. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Hello, everyone. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Hi, I'm Ethan Elm, host of Likeable Science on Think Tech Hawaii. Every Friday afternoon at 2 p.m., I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science, where we'll dig into science, dig into the meat of science, dig into the joy and delight of science. We'll discover why science is indeed fun, why science is interesting, why people should care about science, and care about the research that's being done out there. It's all great, it's all entertaining, it's all educational, so I hope you'll join me for Likeable Science.
we're back. I'm Jay Fidel. That's my cabinet over there. Mike, say hi. Hi, you guys. Oh, there it is. Okay. Okay. And, th and then we have Nathaniel Muller. Now, we just had uh, Natalie Moreland and Gavin Tom, and now we have Nathaniel Muller. What do you guys have in common again? Oh, we are all lucky enough to be taking Richard Walsgrove's class at the William S. Richardson School of Law. Uh, the class course is titled Clean Energy Law and Policy, and he is giving us a myriad of tools in order to properly address the future of our energy economy in the state of Hawaii. Yeah, he's got a lot of experience in that. You knew. Oh, he is, firsthand. Yeah, he's one of the... Yeah. He's oh, very geez. sharp. A little music with every show. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what did you think of the first half? Uh, both of them are pushing... Uh, Excuse me, Ms. Moreland and Mr. Tom are pushing ideas that are... I thought it was uh, Gavin Tom. You're right. Yeah, thank Mr. you. Mr. Gavin Tom. Natalie, never mind. Uh, are pushing forward ideas that are... And this is an issue that we are all touching on. And they are pieces of a whole because we're trying to rapidly change our entire energy infrastructure, our energy economy over a short period of time. And both of you brought up the issue before of reliability. Yeah. That is the end goal for this. And so with regards to exit fees, how reliable are those individuals' own energy needs? Are they being met? And with regards to uh, solar panels being placed on vehicles, the next issue is how much energy are they actually going to be taking off the grid, and how much energy could they actually be, be putting to back into the grid? Yeah. So these are issues that not only uh, compound and aid in the movement towards a new energy future for the state of Hawaii, but also need to be addressed with the potential shortfalls that they could have as well, just like the issue that I'm going to be trying to present as well. Okay, I just want to make a statement and see if Mike agrees with Go me. Go ahead. <clears throat> you know, the whole thing about energy policy um, is not so much the policy, but the acceptance of the policy by, by the stakeholders in the community. And you and I, in our old age, we have seen policy points that could be good and the community rejected. We have seen policy points that could be bad. The community loved it. <laughs> and so the question is educating the public and the legislature and the courts, and for that matter, to some extent, the PUC as well, on whether the policy is good or bad. And you can make so many mistakes, and we will. We have done. We have. Um, so, <laughs> you know, you can find great so social and, and energy technological policy, but at, at the end of the day, it's like litigation. You have to convince people all kinds of people. Otherwise, your policy is on the back shelf. Real nice policy you got there on the back shelf, yeah. So what's your program about? It's not really a program. It is actually more of a fun fact. And the fun fact starts with a number. Every year, it has been estimated by the EIA, the Energy Information Administration, a, uh, a nonpartisan branch of the federal government, that the state of Hawaii sheds off 6.7% of our annual energy production simply via transmission. That's that for electric energy. Yes, literally <laughs> through the lines. Uh, if you guys have ever had the chance to, and I'm sure when you guys are walking along the beach or underneath uh, any of these exposed lines that power our buildings, you can every now and then hear the buzzing. Oh, yeah. That is literal heat energy that is being lost. And even though it might only be 6.7%, in the grand scheme of things, that actually might be a large percentage of energy that we are actually missing out on. The state of Hawaii produces uh, close to 10 million megawatt hours of energy every year. You calculate that out to 6.7% 6 .7 every year, that ends up to be uh, also an EIS, EIA estimate of over 492,000 megawatts. If you are applying the 23 cents per megawatt or per kilowatt hour that a resident of the state of Hawaii pays in their energy, that is almost $117 million literally lost to the air. The next step that we have to address is who is supposed to pay for these sorts of things. And as we've seen it's the fuel costs, it passes on fact. over. These are fun facts. Fun facts, okay. <laughs> as we've seen with fuel costs, it is completely fine to pass that on to the consumer. But the consumer shouldn't be happy with this. Even though the, uh, the energy sector in Hawaii as a whole nears almost $2 billion, uh, $117 million is still a good chunk of change. And again, if we're getting to the transition period, that $117 million, every single dollar spent, needs to be saved in order to successfully get to the new energy future that we're that building up. The point is, is that uh, 
By allowing these losses to continue to occur, we are effectively incentivizing utilities and energy providers to, to shift energy. the costs back to the consumers and therefore succumb well, to waste. So why, how should they conduct themselves differently? And that's a great question. Actually, uh, recently the, uh, the PUC just agreed and accepted the, excuse me, I'm, I know I have a lot of notes. It's can, the. Can I, uh, can I take the notes? You're more than welcome to. It this, is the. This will help me. <laughs> it won't help you, but it'll, well, it'll help you too. Okay. It was an August 2017 uh, grid modernization strategy that was put forward by HECO. It has just recently been approved by the PUC. Uh, and actually, within that, they are looking at piggybacking strategies in order to make sure that they are mitigating energy loss, such things as actual. Uh, real-time measurement systems of electricity as it is flowing through the lines and then suppose I find out about that six percent of loss mm -hmm. right what do I do about it as an individual or as, as a, a utility company I mean the person who has the power that's a pun the power to do something over it it's very difficult right because we're actually well, give me an example of how I might you know alleviate the loss so this comes back to the simple rules of physics behind it. We're talking about ohmic loss, we're talking about corona effects, and again, if I'm coming here as someone who's supposed to be looking at the law, it's very difficult for me to be coming and talking about the science of it. I'm not a physics guy, I'm supposed to be looking at law and policy behind it. This reminds me of the cafe standards, you know, where the, where the, uh, the, the federal authorities uh, say you, you must make a car that will give you 50 miles a gallon on, uh, on gas. You must, or you do must that. make a fleet that gives you an average of 50 bucks a gallon. That's what Whatever, 50 miles uh, however they frame it. So, well, you could have you could have something here too that says to the utility, oh, we're gonna we're gonna you know watch you guys, and we don't want a six percent loss. Then you have to find a way to give us a three percent loss. So, is this is this your paper? Is this your research? Uh, in the end, the outcome, and this is something that I will hope to propose and prove through the fun world of shifting facts and information, of saying that it should those costs should be shifted back into the PUC or the energy provider themselves. But with regards to your question before, how do we, how do we, what do we do actually that. tell the PUC, what do we actually tell these uh, power companies to do? And as of right now, it is most simply putting in new lines. The way that, for a comparison, South Dakota and Wyoming have only around 2% energy loss via transmission. But it's because the majority of their energy is actually transported through over 700, uh, the, it is a 756 kilovolt line, the very big towers. The higher the voltage of the line, the less That's loss. Line. But of course, <clears throat> this system that we have in place is still fairly old, and so the smaller the voltage, the, the more distributed Okay, so the idea would be you, you, you don't lay this, um, well, you lay this on the utility. You say, you're the utility, now we want you to uh, put in new lines and spend the money uh, uh, in order to do that. The utility says, that's fine, but we're going to build that into our rates because we're a utility. And we, and we come to you every so often with a rate increase uh, request, uh, as they have done recently. Um, and it's going to cost us, uh, you know, $500 million to do Oahu. Um, so can you please give us a, a very substantial rate increase? Well, actually, the uh, grid modernization strategy that was agreed on by the PUC was a six-year plan costing over $205 million. Part of their strategy is to mitigate these losses through line, through line loss and transmission loss. So $205 so, so million. So this is already happening. It is already happening. Okay. Uh, but, of course, they are shifting those costs to the consumers. Sure. And you look at the look at the Big Island, and their line losses over there are huge, because you're taking sure. relatively small populations, and you're you're taking a very big island to get the electricity around. I know I pay thirty four cents a kilowatt hour over on the Big Island. So you're talking about a change in the utility law, because this is a different calculation of rates. If you're saying you got to eat it, you guys, you know, uh, and, and instead of giving any dividends to your stockholders, who are going to sell their stock when the word gets out? <laughs> in this model, um, uh, instead, of, instead of giving dividends, you eat it. In fact, maybe you can make a capital call, get the extra money, make a loan, get the extra money, because we're not going to make the uh, taxpayers, ratepayers pay for it. Very true. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. It's, but again, this goes back to just how the, how the actual facts, how capital is gained through these systems as it is today. There is 
really not that much incentive for the utilities or the energy producers to actually eat these costs. They can easily shift it on over to the consumers. But part of this, again, goes back to the actual lines themselves, the actual transmission lines themselves. Uh, as one of the, as China is actually going through and doing, I believe it's called the Belt and Road. One Belt, One Road. Yes. It's also known as the New Silk Road. One of the ideas that they're putting forward is a terawatt line that is going from one side of China to the other. Right. Something similar that we've been talking about and has come up in many HECO issues repeatedly is the intra-island connection. Now, whether that is, again, politically feasible, socially feasible, whether, any, whether that will actually happen. Technically or economically feasible, too. It is economically well, feasible, but the same question, that's people actually ready to do it. Who's going to pay for it? Mike, you got, you got some spare change. Sure. Yeah. Okay, Mike, we're out of time, okay? Uh, and, I, and I would like to uh, get your, you know, you can ask some cross-examination questions of Nathaniel. He's ready. I can tell you he's ready. And or maybe you should do that and then summarize. Which way is the wind blowing at the PUC about this? That's a great question. I'm <laughs> Obviously, the PUC just agreed to... The $205 million dollars over the next six years for a grid modernization. So obviously the PUC is all for it, but again, it's how far are we willing to take it, and whether these means are it. edible. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> we got new commissioners, you know, <clears throat> who are into policy, who are from UH, mm -hmm. not far from your law school, matter of fact. One from HNEI and then another yeah, about just, to be confirmed from HNEI. Yeah, just Malcolm from us. They're, they're, yeah, they're into, they're into energy policy and social policy and all that. And they can make these calculations you're talking about. And they're, you know, up to the, this kind of issue. So maybe we'll see some real change here. Who knows? I'm excited. But it'd be, it. interesting, to see, it'd be interesting to see how they're going to deal with the, the line lost issue. I mean, modernization of the grid is probably far overdue. And as they move toward... Distributed generation is another strategy that could be used to, to reduce the line loss. Actually, that comes along with a lot of fear as well because of the varying amount of voltage that can be entered and then lost into the system because of it becoming, if it is individual parties that are actually putting more energy into the system, one of the parts of the grid modernization strategy is actually real-time monitoring of that so they can properly calculate it. But then we get into death spirals, whether people just immediately jump ship, and whether, as was spoken before in the previous segment, whether this energy regime as we know it today is still a feasible and still has enough money to keep it running. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, if, if you raise rates too high, um, you know, now we're talking grid. about this, if you raise rates too high, people are going to do the, the bailout thing. They're going to they're separate. And in that case, uh, that, that's a spiral down because then the utility has less money coming in and they have to find another way to make it up. So um, we've really covered some interesting issues here yeah. today. Uh, their yeah. policy, their energy policy, and, and their law policy. This is an interesting class. I might sign up. Um, so, <laughs> you know. You want to sign them up? <laughs> your registration you opens in form? two weeks. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, thank you. Opens. <laughs> Mike, can you summarize this and sort of close the show? Could you? Well, I think that the, uh, the law school is, I think the, the class that they're, they're taking is an interesting class, and it's about time we got some uh, some other folks involved in discussions about the whole energy issue, and I think the law side of it is very interesting, especially with what we've gone through with the uh, changes in the feed-in tariff and and, all, and the uh, net metering and all that. And I'm just waiting for the dust to settle, and I'm not sure. I mean, these guys are going to be watching the dust settle. Yeah, so. they'll be determining what happens as we get to 2040, 20, yeah. 2045. Yeah. So at the end of the day. I'm talking to all three of you at the end of the day, assuming you stay in Hawaii, you can stay in Hawaii, right? Okay, I heard Warm. you. Just speak under oath. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, you guys will be instrumental in the, in the last chapters of this huge initiative that we have seen begin. I mean, Mike was there when it just began, but you're going to see the end of it. Isn't that exciting? And you'll have a lot more to say than he and I then. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. I, I do love a happy ending. Movies or otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're, well, it's we're, a happy we're, ending. we're working on the happy we're ending. We're working on <laughs> a happy ending here uh, for the intersection of our energy and the law uh, with uh, my co host and co chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum, 
Mike Hamnett, with uh, Gavin Tom, with Natalie Moreland, and with Nathaniel Muller. Thank you very much. And thank you to uh, Richard Walsgrove for making this all happen, and to Avi Soy for making, making the law school what it is today. Very nice. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you guys, everyone. too. Thanks, Kevin. Aloha.